your heart and your heart be the beacon that will guide everyone to the starlight. Peace be to you, to your thoughts and your vision. May you always bring cheer to those sad eyes that cry. May you see one another as relations, sister and brother. And may you feel this way every day and all through the year, year after year, after year, after year. Everybody, la, la, la. Two more? Two more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Oh, 
This is written by a good friend of mine, Vaughn Singer, a co-founder of Kitka, who's here in the Bay Area, and also Ya'ela. Refua Shlema. Can you say that? Refua Shlema. Refua Shlema. That means entire, complete healing. And then she gave me permission to adapt the Metta Sutta practice, which is the loving kindness practice. So this is all call response.
known and unseen and unfeeling, all being. Be contented. Together can we go. May all beings be contented. May all beings be well. May all
welcome ancestors from the east. Welcome here. Now we call in our global ancestors from the south with the element of fire. Make sounds of fire in the world. Now we call in the global ancestors from the direction of the west and the elemental water. of the north and the element of earth.
intention, with intention, to make this a world of peace. Cooperation, collaboration, not competition. Working together, using our voices to speak for peace. Cease fire now! 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. There you go. Blessed be, welcome all the directions, the global ancestors, and the elemental spirits of which we are made. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, everyone, Thank you, everyone here in person. Thank you, everyone on Zoom, online. Thanks. Yeah, don't face the speaker. Just move away from the speaker. Yeah. I'll face this way. So, our centering words, our centering words for today, our call to worship. Poet, professor, and activist, Befayat Alayer. He was a native of the Gaza Strip. He was killed on December 7th, earlier this month, when Israeli airstrikes bombed his sister's home in Gaza, where he was staying. Alayer's brother, sister, and four children were also killed in that strike. Ben Alayer was a beloved professor of English literature at the Islamic University in Gaza, and days before his death on December 7th, he posted this poem, If I Must Die, on social media. If I must die, you must live. To tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some string. Make it white to the long tail. So that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad, who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and think for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. And now we are going to be singing a song called Break the Cycle of Violence. We're just going to sing the first line of the song, and it's a call and response. And so I'll sing the first line, and Emily is going to help us just sing the second line, and we'll actually just do the very first verse. So we'll teach it one time through. And then let's sing it together a few times. This song is Break the Cycle of Violence from Emma's Revolution. Break the cycle of violence. Break the cycle of violence. Thousands die by your silence. Thousands die by your silence. We need a ceasefire now. We need a ceasefire now. Break the cycle of violence. Break the cycle of violence. Thousands die by your silence. Thousands die by your violence. We need a ceasefire now. We need a ceasefire now. Break the cycle of violence. Break the cycle of violence. Thousands die by your silence. Thousand die by your silence. We need a ceasefire now. We need a ceasefire now. We need a ceasefire now. We need 
the seas fire now. We need a cease fire now. We need a cease fire now. Amen. Blessed be. We're gathered here on New Year's Day as the changing of the years to honor the past, the present, and the future. And that relates, too, to our global struggles as members of the Global South. And I'd like to offer this reflection on the past. The pain, sufferings, oppressions, and atrocities of today were not born out of a vacuum. The genocide in Gaza and Palestine did not just suddenly begin on October 8th. Our world, all of us, live within the unholy legacies of colonization, militarism, and imperialism. A legacy that has brought all of us, and especially the people of Palestine today, to this current moment of unfathomable destruction and death. What we are witnessing today in Gaza, in the West Bank, the Israeli government's efforts to erase both the indigenous and broader Palestinian diaspora is such a clear example of what happens when our humanity is willfully not just ignored, but actively denied for generations. What we are witnessing today is a violation of the sacredness of life, built upon a global practice of separation, domination, and control that much of the Western world is responsible for imposing on the rest of us. What we are witnessing today is a violation of our obligation that we have as being born out of a divine source to care for one another, to know one another, to ensure one another's well-being and safety, a violation brought about by a twisted desire for power, wealth, and cultural supremacy. These violations, these practices, these desires, this unholy legacy has roots in ways of thinking that stray from our innate potential for good. They have roots in ways of thinking that would have us believe our safety depends. I have been in the grief of what's happening to Palestinians has kept me up at night and distracted me from daytime activities. Our current reality is that over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed since October 7th and 11,000 have been children. This breaks my heart more with Some people say that these are things that happen in war. Sometimes there are just casualties. I do not accept that, beloved. I do not accept the killing of thousands of children. And for those children who they're often left disabled, homeless, or orphaned. This cannot be our current reality. But it is. That feminist scholar, Bell Hooks, once said that if you want to change the world, change the way you kill children. They are the most vulnerable among us, yet the least terrible. I want us to release a civilian casualty and honor all the lives that have been taken from us. The future is now. We must protect, fight for, and breathe in what is needed to be done. We are the future. Everything matters that we do now. Life is precious. It is also impermanent. But the fight to preserve the freedoms and the right to live is not. That rests with us and the next generation. Let us pray for a future where it is not a dream to be free. We are free, where it is not a dream to be equal, that we are equal. It is not a dream to have enough to eat, to feel safe. It is a 
reality. That is the future we will build. We are building it now. As we stand here, all of us today, we are making the future. And so I call on all of you to take with you today the intention to change the world, to move forward with your heart. You know what must be done. Our voices must be heard. Silence is no longer what we do. We are. We are, as our you, you him says, the light of our ancestors, wherever we come from. We are the builders of truth. So let us do this together. Are you with me? Yes! Then let's do this. Let's build the future. Cease fire now. Cease fire now. My name is Kevin Mann, and I'm one of the reverend community ministers here. And a few weeks ago, we hang up our Peace, Shalom, Shalom banner, as well as our Ceasefire banner. And those two banners, along with Love Demands Permanent Ceasefire from the Oakland Ceasefire Coalition, we're here excited to do a blessing for our banners. So, God of many names, guide us this hour towards a permanent ceasefire. 85 days into the catastrophic assault on occupied Gaza, we grieve for over 21,000, 21,000 minimum Palestinian civilian killed, nearly half of them children. We also grieve the 1,200 Israeli lives lost on October 7th, and we grieve for the 1.9 million Gazan people that since October 7th have been without electricity, food, water, fuel, or medical supplies as their homes must endure a blank check of U.S.-made bombs raining down on them. Our faith tells us that the answer to war crimes must not be more war crimes. We pray for a peace, a peace that will last a thousand years. We pray for a peaceful coexistence, free of apartheid, free of oppression, free of military checkpoints and military sieges, free of the sins of settler colonization. We bless these banners with a fierce sense of the urgency of now, as Reverend Dr. King called it. We charge these banners, we charge these signs, we charge these chalk drawings with our love, with our strength, with our courage. We charge this gathered community this town of Oakland, and our whole Bay Area, we rise with the local movement calling for a ceasefire. We rise with St. Columna Catholic Church in West Oakland, also holding their vigil and their banner and blessing right now. From occupied Ohlone territory in Oakland, California, to occupied Gaza and Palestine, we lift up the inherent worth and dignity of every child every parent, every life gone too soon. We mourn, we rage, and we proclaim loud and clear the inherent worth and dignity of every single life. It's all of us or none of us. Let these banners bring us hope. Let these banners tell us a tale. Amen. There's a song that comes from some of our movement work that I'm going to invite us into. The words are, when the world is sick, 
Can't no one be well? But I dreamt we were all beautiful and strong. When the world is sick, when the world is sick, can no one be well? Can no one be well? But I dreamt we were all beautiful and strong. But I dreamt we were all beautiful and strong. Let's sing that together. When the world is sick, can no one be well? But I dreamt we were all beautiful and strong. When the world is sick, can no one be well? But I dreamt we were all beautiful and strong. When the world is sick, when the world is sick, can the world be beautiful and strong? be beautiful and strong. All right, thank you, beloved. We're kind of close to our vigil. Um, we will be having you guys for our session. So we have a few of the speakers. So we can share more adaptations of all of them. So we can all get them back. Um, so thank you so much for being here. That's all your spirit. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you want to meet Jura, go ahead. are welcome to head aside for the teaching. We'll start that in about 10 or so minutes. Get check out one up there. Please grab some snacks. Continue to make some fun while you're in there. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Grateful to be here. Um, my name is Brooke Loger, and um, I'm an activist and also a scholar. I teach in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at UC Berkeley, and I also teach in that same department at Sonoma State University. I'm a lecturer in both schools. Um, and for the last number, uh, for the last lot of years, I don't know, five or six, maybe seven years, um, I've been um, spending time with people who participated in grassroots social movements here in the Bay Area with a focus on anti-imperialism, anti-Zionism, and abolition, particularly as Jewish feminists have participated in those movements from here in the Bay. And those oral histories have been published um, in the journal Sinister Wisdom. I've also written work in the journals Feminist Formations and Women's Studies, mostly about this social movement history that I've been learning about. So I'd be excited to share some of that um, as part of what I talk about today. And I'm also the co-editor of um, two volumes of um, anthologies called Abolition Feminisms, and they came out with Haymarket Press last year. So that's that's some of the, the, the scholarly work that I do, and I'm here representing Jewish Voice for Peace Bay Area. I organize locally with Jewish Voice for Peace. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Grace Shimizu. I'm born in the Qing, in unceded and stolen Shoshone Ohlone territory in what is now known as Berkeley, California, and I reside in Oakland, California, USA. Oh, just closer. Okay. I'm a Japanese American whose family members on both on my parents' side were incarcerated in four of the 10 US concentration camps run by the War Relocation Authority, which imprisoned more than 110,000 US citizens and immigrant residents of Japanese ancestry during World War II. I'm also a descendant of the 2,264 Japanese Latin Americans who were kidnapped from 13 Latin American countries and brought to the US for indefinite internment, another set of US concentration camps run by the Department of Justice. 
Many were used in two hostage exchanges for U.S. citizens caught in the war zones of Asia. My father, who was a Japanese immigrant resident of Peru, and other family members were targeted under this World War II style extraordinary rendition program orchestrated by the U.S. government. As part of the Japanese American community in the U.S. and the Nikkei diaspora, we continue the justice struggle for U.S. government accountability and reparations for fundamental human rights uh, violations perpetrated during and after World War II. I serve as a director of the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans, and of the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project, as well as uh, being the project manager of the groundbreaking traveling and online exhibit, The Enemy Alien Files, Hidden Stories of World War II. I'm also on the executive committee member of um, San Francisco Bay Area Comfort Women Justice Coalition. My solidarity work includes support for the U.S. slavery reparations movement, for the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies, Ahmed, at San Francisco State University and its director, Dr. Rabab Abdihadi, and for Wadi, uh, Friends of Wadi Fukin, a Palestinian village in the West Bank under illegal Israeli occupation. Thank you for welcoming me to join you in this wonderful opportunity uh, to express our solidarity with the Palestinian people and to learn, share, be inspired, and become energized together. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Farah Mahesri. Uh, I also live here on unceded Ohlone territory in Oakland. And I organize with the Alliance of South Asians Taking Action, ASATA, which is a progressive South Asian group here in the Bay Area. Uh, we organize nationally with other progressive South Asian groups. I am also Shia Muslim, uh, having kind of grown up in the post 9-11 United States. Um, and I do a lot of anti-war work more broadly, so I'm part of the Center for Political Education's anti-war working group. And I spent about 10 years post 9-11 living and working in Muslim majority countries, trying to really wrap my head around what US war making, imperialism, and empire looks like abroad. Um, and so I am so just really thankful for all of you and for the space to be able to talk about and continue to learn about anti-war, uh, organizing as anti-imperialists, and really kind of fighting against militarism more broadly. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Reverend Janelle Nicolas Oblola. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and sha. I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, I'm currently serving as lead pastor at Pine United Methodist Church in San Francisco, which is a historically Japanese American church, um, but the first Asian American United Methodist Church to be open and affirming to LGBTQ people. Um, I also serve as co-chair of the California Nevada Philippine Solidarity Task Force of the United Methodist Church. It is a volunteer-led ministry that works very closely with uh, grassroots organizations locally. And for over a decade, I've been um, involved in the movement for democracy and human rights and a just and lasting peace in the Philippines. Uh, since 2009, through the task force, I've led uh, pastoral and solidarity visits to the Philippines. I have gone to different parts of the Philippines, over 70 provinces now because of this work that we do in partnership with the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. Um, aside from that, I am passionate for uh, journeying with folks as they develop their internationalist and anti-imperialist uh, praxis as people of faith. Um, and I also um, have, have two cats at home, tuxedo cats. Hello everyone and good afternoon. My name is Ahmed Rashid Salim. Uh, I didn't prepare a bio. I wear a couple of different hats. None of them I brought with me today. Um, but primarily I'm an author and scholar. Uh, my fields of research uh, deal with the Middle East, Islamic studies, and Persian language and literature. 
I'm currently at the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Literatures at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm also the Imam or spiritual leader at the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California. Uh, so I look very forward to a very engaging and uh, informed discussion with my co-panelists and also all of you folks in attendance. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zainab Ramahi. I, uh, my father is Palestinian and my mother is Kashmiri. I grew up, I was raised in North America. I actually lived down the street from 14th and Market, so this was very convenient for me. Um, and I, so my father's family, um, my, my grandfather is from a village called Mzera, which is now um, rubble under the airport in Tel Aviv. And my uh, grandmother is from the West Bank. She continues to live there. Uh, most of my uh, father's family are refugees and, and have resettled all around the world and primarily in Jordan. My mother's family is from Kashmir, another uh, colonized, uh, military-occupied land. For those who are not familiar, Kashmir is uh, located and occupied by um, China, India, and Pakistan. So it's located right kind of in the intersection of those, of those three countries. It is the highest militarized zone in the world uh, for every seven Kashmiri people. There is a soldier there, um, you know, patrolling the streets, uh, kidnapping and, and, and torturing. And it's, it's unfortunately not a, a cause that a lot of people know much about because I think India has been very successful in portraying it as an internal issue or a dispute between India and Pakistan. Um, so much of my, my academic research and work has focused on ethno-nationalism and settler colonial issues, on the relationship between India and Israel. They have a very strong uh, military relationship. Um, it is growing stronger by the day. When I was last in Kashmir this November, actually, uh, what I heard from people was that Kashmiris are watching what is going on in Gaza right now and um, understanding how far India could go in Kashmir without anyone, you know, batting an eyelash, basically. So that really locates my uh, passion and, and, and interest for issues of, of justice. Uh, aside from that, I'm an attorney working in San Francisco. I've been living in Oakland for the past few years. I have previously organized with and continue to organize with Palestine Legal, uh, which is sort of the first of its kind organization supporting Palestine activism in a legal capacity in the United States. Um, I was involved with Students for Justice in Palestine in college and at law school at UC Berkeley and helped to organize the first ever Paltrek at UC Berkeley uh, to Palestine. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. I know that that was not what I had initially communicated to some of you. Um, but uh, I just want to offer a, a space for us to first check in as people, um, because this is a, a faith space and many of us are people of faith doing this work from that lens as well. So just in this moment, moment in the world, this moment in time, how is it with your spirit? Take a breath, take a beat, and then answer as you feel called. Well, my spirit and body has been running the gamut of mixed feelings, emotions, aches, and pains. Um, there's the ongoing daily shock and horror, anger, sadness, grief, guilt, hopeless, a helplessness feeling, triggers, depression, numbness, uh, shit buried from consciousness that has yet to be, have words put to it. You know, but what keeps my spirit grounded, inspired, developing, and expanding is the example and leadership of the Palestinian people, especially of the Palestinian youth right here in the San Francisco Bay Area, like the Palestinian Youth Movement. And there's also the ongoing visible expression of human beings around the world, of humanity in solidarity with the Palestinian people and they're connecting the dots with histories, struggles for survival and social justice, and visions of a better world across borders. So. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that this time has been really overwhelming and I feel very unsettled. Um, the last few months haven't been like any other months of my life and I don't think they've been really like any other months on the planet. Um, but I guess I'll speak specifically as a Jewish person. Um, the the um, psychologist Gabor Mate, who's a child survivor of the Holocaust, has been speaking on this issue. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me was that he said, I feel like this is the worst thing that ever happened. Um, and so just to say that um, as someone who is very, um, I've been in this, the, the Palestine Solidarity Movement as a Jewish person for many years, and um, this is what we couldn't have imagined, but also would have hoped to prevent. Um, and so it's extremely painful to see the use of the Nazi Holocaust and the historical violence and racism against Jewish people in Europe to be used to commit atrocities that produce more traumas. It made sense to me that a psychologist would say this is the worst thing that could happen. This is the worst outcome um, of those histories of violence that actually have in them the seed of a very different lesson for how we should live together on this planet. And um, and I agree, I agree that that the the incredible spirit of Palestinian people. Um, for me, watching the young photojournalists um, in Gaza who have chosen to be out there every day sharing their stories, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. So I don't want to say that the time isn't without an incredible um, spirit and an incredible pride that we're, we're watching Palestinian people face um, this calamity. But I do feel um, like it's it's... It's very hard to watch also even hear the, the Jewish, Jewish people split so much on this issue, which we knew would happen, but um, it's extremely painful. So thank you for the question. Um, I can just quickly add, I saw something yesterday where someone had posted that there is a tiredness of the body that can be kind of fixed with sleep, and there is a tiredness of the soul, which can't. And I was like, aha, that's why I can't seem to sleep off or catch up or feel rested of any kind. Um, I don't even know if I can put into words the sorrow and horror and everything that I feel for um, Palestinians in Gaza Palestinians around the world and everything they are going through. Um, so I'm not going to even try to do that. I think the one other thing I would add that was actually quite surprising for myself was realizing how much trauma I was holding in the po from the post 9-11 era that has emerged with, I don't know what are the words to use, almost kind of like with vengeance in my body and my everything. Um, I had, I think, really fooled myself into thinking that maybe we had healed or solved or I had personally done some of these things. And over the last 85 days, it has been kind of personally unsettling for me to realize how much vulnerability and precarity I guess I just internalized and lived with. So thank you. Um, also grateful to be asked this question. Um, I um, didn't realize that everyone was feeling very similar things, um, just because I guess how, uh, when we're not asked that question, we kind of have to show up how we can show up, right, and look like things are okay as much as possible in order to function and to move through spaces. Um, yeah, I've been experiencing a lot of what folks have named here in this space. Um, a lot of like also feeling some deep like ancestral stuff <laughs> and anger um, and also just deep, um, deep uh, grief. Um, I um, also have been feeling really, um, I don't know, been feeling just really uh, getting a lot out of the Palestinian Christians on the ground and also Palestinian Muslims, um, 
how folks have been speaking to their faith. Um, folks have been finding faith again, especially in the Christmas season, people reconnecting to Jesus in different ways and that Jesus was made enfleshed for folks in ways that has not been before because of how Jesus has been taken out of context, right? Now we're seeing Jesus being put back into context in very, um, in the realities of occupation and um, have just been, I don't know, kind of, kind of being hopeful and seeing how people are doing that and how it's um, informing how they show up for and with one another um, and creating a culture of showing up in ways that <laughs> are tender, in ways that recognize our humanity, in ways that are also not compromising in the conviction of it all as well. Um, yeah, I could go on, but thank you for that question. I don't feel like I've really been asked that question that much. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Um, I too want to echo the the very heartfelt words and sentiments of uh, the folks who spoke prior to me. Maybe I'd add one more thing, which is as devastating and horrific and haunting the images, the sounds, the visuals, the stories coming out of Gaza, coming out of the uh, occupied Palestinian territories. And also we should not forget Southern Lebanon and starting today with the US bombing of the Houthi ships, um, what seems to be um, a, an extension of this type of violence on yet another uh, country. Um, it's been kind of layered for me. Uh, one is a personal uh, feeling and engagement and entanglement with feelings and emotions. And then the other one is of course, for those who are in roles of leadership, faith leadership, whatever uh, teaching, uh, community organizing, whatever it may be. But one of the things that I'd like to add is this time has also been a very illuminating time for me. And that is because it has shown myself and I'm sure all of you that we are not desensitized. And I think that is a very powerful thing. And that's something that in spite of the heartache and in spite of the horrors, I try to remind myself and recollect that one of the dangers that can happen for any individual is to see suffering and to see the severity of such suffering and not to be impacted by it. So anytime I've been moved to tears, I've been moved to anger, I've been moved to heart and heartache, I'm actually grateful for it because it conveys to me that I still feel. And for me, that is a very, very sacred thing. And that's something that I think can collect us towards collective action. Um, I, I can't really begin to engage with that question uh, without just like completely breaking down. And so I think a, a lot of what I do each day is um, remove myself from myself. I don't know what sort of violence that does to one's soul, but I'm kind of in this, quite frankly, this tension between centering my feelings and, and, and what my spirit is going through and realizing that, you know, I, I'm physically safe and I have a, a roof over my head and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not worried that my loved ones um, will be dead by the end of the day. And so, you know, I'm, I don't, if anybody has any solutions, you can let me know, but I think we have this uh, sort of the, the neoliberal approach to therapy really centers on, you know, you and your feelings and, and you know, do you have vicarious trauma and PTSD and all of this? And I, I just think that everything that we're going through and everything that all of the panelists here today have expressed that they're going through is the only possible human reaction to what is going on and that we can't feel anything but, you know, totally broken by this while also remembering that Ghazans specifically have said, we don't want your sympathy and we don't need your pity. We need your action. We're here in the United States. You know, our social location is quite unique. Our political location is unique in the world. Everyone has a role to play, but you know, Israel would not be doing what it is doing with, without the United States' backing, support, and, you know, cheering on. Um, and so when I, when I think, when I get lost a little bit too much in how I feel, I, I think about the responsibility that I have uh, to muster up, you know, whatever courage and strength that I have to, to do what little I can.
appreciate the musical microphones. Thank you all for engaging that question um, as honestly as you can. Um, and I, I want to um, dive a little bit deeper into, into some of what you said with some uh, a variation of, of what um, was sent out to you around uh, our, your own social locations. Everybody is coming in with, you know, as you've described, your own ancestral um, relationships, your own cultural uh, backgrounds and, and experiences. And so thinking about how from your own social location and, you know, your own community's experience, your own individual and, and, and family's experience of um, the legacies of colonization and, and militarism, why is it so important to be in solidarity with the movement? For those of us that are it's in solidarity, for those of us that it is our own liberation in this moment, um, uh, but why is it so important to be in solidarity with the movement uh, with uh, Palestine and the people of Palestine? Um, for, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. And please feel free to engage one another. It does not need to be a back and forth between you and me. Okay, um, I'm just gonna back up a little bit uh, from the question in regards to like just how colonization has showed up and um, for Filipino people in particular, um, you know, I, we could talk a long time about the history, but just like briefly, um, the Philippines being considered the gateway to Asia has had a lot of a long history of colonization from Spain that came and um, colonized, was a colonial force there for 300 years, even a little bit longer than Spain was in Mexico. Um, and then we had the US come right after that time as Spain um, sold, sold the Philippines in a, as a package deal um, to the US. And then um, during World War II, we had Japan occupy for a few years, and then the US come back again. Um, and the US after 9-11, uh, declaring the Philippines as the second front on the war on terror has had a very uh, long impact in regards to what ha what the dynamics are in the Philippines currently. Um, there are unequal relationships between the U.S. and the Philippines in regards to um, the Philippine oligarchs prioritizing the interests of the U.S., meaning like being open to having U.S. military bases there, um, you know, um, having multinational corporations come in rather than backing national industries in the Philippines. Um, in the Philippines, um, we, have, we have something called the three basic problems, which are sort of the root problems of what's going on in the Philippines, being U.S. imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. Um, and these things have made it so that the Filipino people continue to be poor and struggle under poverty uh, while the Philippines continues to be rich in regards to its land, its resources, um, all the resources that it has to be able to sustain and feed and feed the people. Alongside that, with the colonial history, you have this long history of suppression of dissenting voices, voices that will speak up and criticize the government. Um, so that, that's just some of the colonial history. Um, that I wanted to name here. I also wanted to raise that another impact of that colonial history is that the Philippines has a legacy of resistance. I'm not saying that colonialism was a good thing at all, uh, but because of it, the Filipino people have composted it into a legacy of resistance. Uh, we have Asia's first anti-colonial revolution against a European power. We also have um, Asia's, if not the world's, longest leftist resistance movement um, there. And because of diaspora, because of the conditions of the Philippines that have forced Filipinos to seek work abroad, to up to the numbers of 6,000 Filipinos leaving the Philippines a day, because of that level of diaspora, we are in a position to wage solidarity wherever we are. Um, resistance is in who we are as, pe as Filipino people. Um, 
And because of that, because of this identity, because of this long legacy of, of, uh, of anti-imperialism, this long legacy of revolution, this long legacy of resistance, it's our responsibility to rise in solidarity with all those who are rising against imperialism, including the people of Palestine. Um, whether people are able to see direct connections to Palestine or not, I think as people who are, who are called to rise up against evil and injustice wherever we see it, it's our responsibility then to also align ourselves with uh, the liberation of the people of Palestine. I just, I just wanted to build on what you were saying about resistance being in our bloodlines, because I have been thinking about that a lot as well. Um, not just kind of the, the trauma that we've inherited or I've inherited from surviving, my family's Pakistani, so having survived partition and kind of the, the violence of what decolonization looked like um, and continues to look like in South Asia, but also that colonial struggle is a family lineage um, and that my ancestors left me with as much strength and power and understanding and wisdom to continue these struggles. Um, and I also draw upon, so kind of, when I think about what my location is, what my identity is, and from like what places I'm resisting, some of that is my lineage and, and drawing on that strength and drawing on all of the, again, that wisdom and the power that I, I've inherited, the legacy of anti-colonial, anti-imperial resistance. Um, I think also, as you were saying as well about my faith lineage um, as Shia Muslim, struggle against injustice is deeply rooted in every aspect of my being. And so relying on faith in moments of crisis. Um, and then just quickly, two other pieces. I also feel the very kind of diasporic piece as well. So um, wanting and continuing to fight against imperialism here in the United States and dismantling everything that we've unleashed on the world is really important. I also look at South Asia, everything that's happening in Pakistan, that Pakistan continues to occupy Kashmir, um, that Pakistan is deporting over a million Afghani refugees right now, that there is a lot of things happening in my homelands, um, continuing to fight in, against Hindutva in India, the rise of kind of anti-Muslim sentiment there. And so also kind of holding that both and of like resisting here against American imperialism and empire, and also continuing to push my community and my homelands and my people in diaspora against these remnants of empire, the corruption of empire, the corruption of imperialism and white supremacy culture that embed and infuse through our homelands as well, and through that, through our kind of diasporic communities as well, and remembering to also push back against that, to continue to name those pieces as well. And I, I think for me as a Pakistani American, just to be very honest, Pakistanis are, have always been in strong solidarity with Palestine. What I'm asking my Pakistani community now to do is to be in greater solidarity with other movements, to be in greater understanding and analysis of how our liberation struggles are interconnected, that we can't choose to support Palestine unconditionally and then not also fight for black liberation, for indigenous liberation here in the United States. And so in this moment, trying to carve out that space to still kind of love and hold my community and push ourselves to tap into that lineage of resistance and be better in all of those ways. Uh, 
Uh, these questions keep getting better and better, so I'm excited for the next question. Um, if I were to divide this into two aspects, the first one will be one of religious commitments and, and spiritual, uh, ethical kind of standards and, and moral beliefs. Uh, and as some of the other folks mentioned here, um, I think all religious traditions really call on the faithful towards the upholding and the protection of rights, of safety, of justice, uh, of preventing injustice, taking hand and, and, and taking control. And within the Islamic uh, tradition, this is in fact a very central theme. Uh, there are various words that are used in the, in the Holy Quran, uh, including qist, which means a socio-political justice, as well as adil, which is a general justice, uh, and many other things. Uh, so for me, as someone who is committed to the spiritual tradition, uh, justice is one of a moral obligation that I'm committed to. Now, in addition to that, there are further layers and further kind of entanglements. I grew up in the United States. I live here. I pay taxes more than some corporations, ironically, as many of you know. And it is without a doubt that our elected officials and our tax money is being utilized to fund this genocide uh, taking place in, uh, in occupied Palestinian lands. However, on a more personal level, if these additional things were not personal enough, I'm also someone who became a refugee as a result of war. Um, I was born in Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, and my parents were forced to become refugees as a result of the civil war of the 90s that was taking place there. However, what's oftentimes forgotten and erased, and this is the really important thing about language and about narratives and about representation and misrepresentation, is the truth of history and historical developments. So all of you and all of us refer to this land or this country as Afghanistan. Afghanistan translates to the land of the Afghans. But Afghan or Afghan refers to one particular ethnic group, the Pashtuns. This, in fact, these individuals do not, or this ethnic group, do not form the majority or even the vast indigenous population of the land that is now known as Afghanistan. The people who are the indigenous people of this country are the Tajiks and the Uzbeks. These individuals have experienced, and my family is Tajik, and they're also Qizilbash, they have experienced many of the same fundamental things that the Palestinians have historically experienced, including localized colonization, the usurpation of their lands, vast and mass killings and violence, the prevention of the usage of their own language, the uh, rebranding of local cuisines and literature as Afghan, uh, the prevention of uh, having access to resources, um, uh, enslavement, uh, changing of local names in local areas uh, into things that sound more Pashtun or more Afghan in, in other words. And, um, in addition to that, since 1979 up until 1991, the people of Afghanistan suffered under Soviet invasion and colonization and a proxy government, um, which led to the killing of over one million people in that country, including the, the Marxist uh, government uh, that was supported by the uh, Soviet Union. One of the very first things that they did is have a program of killing religious scholars, intellectuals, teachers, engineers, entrepreneurs, and high school students. So just from my mom's side of the family, 37 people were killed in the span of 1979 to 1980, the youngest of them being 17 years old. Half of the country, as a result of the Soviet invasion, was forced to dislocate and seek refuge in places like Pakistan, places like Iran, and for those who were lucky enough, 
to the United States or Europe, Australia, Canada, and elsewhere. So for example, my family, as a result of this type of violence, um, are scattered across the globe. I have family in Australia, I have family in Germany, I have family in the United States and vast things. And at a personal and social and familial level, this is a very destructive thing because this, these types of traditional societies really have a commitment to collective being. And the emotional and psychological toll that this has taken on our elders is tremendous. Now, the last thing that I'll mention here is that the story of the U.S. role in colonization, whether it is broader imperialism or whether it is more regional uh, and localized colonization, is something that is still impacting Afghanistan. From 1996 to 2001, um, an extremist terrorist group by the name of the Taliban was brought into power with the direct aid and enablement of the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Agency. Um, any scholar of the field will note that the Taliban did not have any type of mass appeal nor support, and there's uh, tremendous uh, evidence that they were supported by the, uh, by the Pakistani government. From 2001 until 2021, the United States and the coalition once again went into Afghanistan and this led to a sort of a burgeoning and a proliferation of various things within the country, including development and a very nascent attempt at establishing a republic. But what happened during that time was the continuation of the support of uh, groups such as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and other groups by countries, again, like Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, and the United States, which prevented the people from having a chance at stability and peace. So my family, again, lost a number of individuals as a result of suicide bombings that the Taliban were responsible for. And since August of 2021, when the United States signed the Doha Agreement, um, the Doha Agreement is a two-page agreement, and I invite all of you to read it. It essentially shows that the United States and the Taliban came to a political agreement to work with one another. The Taliban did not defeat the United States. The United States actively worked against the government of President Ghani to prevent them from having a peaceful resolution and a peaceful solution. And they essentially handed over the country back to the Taliban. And since August of 2021, Tajiks have been arrested in mass. They have been uh, subjected to, and I'm very sorry uh, to mention this, to sexual violence, both for boys, men, and women. There have been extrajudicial killings that are taking place. Girls are not allowed to go to school. There has been a proliferation of extremist schoolings where young children are brainwashed. But none of those things make it to the Western media because the page has been turned. Afghanistan does not matter anymore. So for me, when it comes to solidarity, it's an issue of dehumanization. It's an issue of both personal experience, but it's also an issue of outrage at the hypocrisy and the very mercurial way in which empire decides who we support and who we do not support without any consideration to the generational impact and violence and death and decimation and destruction that, that ensues. I have very little to add here, but I will say that, you know, thinking about, there's different ways to approach this question, but thinking about, you know, somebody here in this room, somebody who's, who's in the United States, who's living in Oakland, why, why should you care about Palestine? Why should you be in solidarity with the Palestinians? I think, you know, here in the Bay Area, we're, we're proud that I think a lot of people claim to have progressive values and to care about justice movements. And Palestine has become a litmus test for, you know, the extent to which those Commitments truly exist. Uh, I think a lot of us have heard by now the phrase progressive except for Palestine. There are these PEPs, you know, as, as it's abbreviated. Um, it really, Palestine is, is an issue that highlights the intersection of, of many issues. 
Um, it's an environmental justice issue. It's a feminist issue. Uh, it's an issue about settler colonization and, and ethno-nationalism. There are many entry points through which somebody can come to care about what is going on in Palestine. But also, fundamentally for me, it's an issue of self-determination. Um, many people here have talked about how their faith uh, gives them, in fact, the responsibility to witness and to fight against oppression. And I'm Muslim, and I have that same fundamental responsibility, regardless of my parentage and the fact that, you know, being Palestinian and Kashmiri and resisting occupation is literally in my blood. Regardless of that, I, I do have, an, have an, a responsibility to, uh, to fight injustice, to call it out, to name it where I see it. Um, and then on top of that, self-determination. To create the, the conditions for self-determination, you need to have a home. You need to have access to food, to health care, to clean water. We don't have that for all people here in Oakland because our governments are more concerned about spending money funding a genocide in Gaza. This is intimately connected to our own well-being and the well-being of our communities here in the United States. So before we can profess to truly care about our own communities, I think we have to look at our, our responsibility and what's going on uh, across the world, not only in Palestine, but I think Palestine is an excellent example. And once we start to look at that, uh, we see the, reason, the reasons to be in solidarity with Palestinians become very clear, and it becomes very clear that their justice is intimately connected with the justice of our own communities here. Um, yeah, thank, thanks everyone for, for sharing on this. It's, it means a lot to hear you all. Um, I think that there's a, um, you know, there's kind of an orientation to my own family that I do bring with me in the political work that I do. So maybe I can share a little bit of that. Um, I don't think that it, it doesn't speak for all, but uh, in terms of my social location, and there was a question that we were sent about the impact of colonialism and imperialism on our communities and how that's still present. And I think that for there are various there there are various Jewish histories, legacies, there are various Jewish ethnicities, and they wouldn't really approach this question in the same way. Um, but my own family um, is from um, Minsk, which is in present-day Belarus, and Lublin, which is in present-day Poland. And um, my understanding of my family is that they were colonized people um, historically, and they were people who experienced religious prejudice for a thousand years. Um, Jews were evacuated from Europe, um, and, and, and Muslims were also subject to right, the terrors of the Inquisition. Um, and um, over, over centuries, that religious prejudice became racialized. So at some point, you know, there was a belief that Jewish people were racially inferior within Europe. And um, there were many, many laws, you know, that inhibited their participation in mainstream society. And in some cases, people converted in order to overcome those barriers. Um, and so my own family um, fled different kinds of violence from Europe, um, and I think that that is the product of, um, of colonization and racialization. Um, and so um, those, those two family lineages kind of remain in my mind when I do this work. Um, and just in, in general, understanding my social location here, um, my father's family fled kind of in the, in the years that preceded the Nazi Holocaust. And um, two cousins besides my father's family, his nuclear family, were able to escape Europe. One went to Argentina, and I have a big family there in Argentina. And the other was a follower of Jabotinsky, and he joined the Irgun and participated in the um, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which took place, you know, around the years surrounding 1948. And um, 
That included, of course, perpetrating massacre and other horrors, including sexual violence, um, and created the mass displacement of Palestinian people at that time that has now been superseded in numbers in these, in these past months. But as um, you know, the, the Palestinian term, the Nakba means catastrophe, and this was a cataclysmic historical change um, that historically a member of my family, one that I know of, participated in. Um, and my father's family came here to California and were from Los Angeles. Um, and my mother's family, my, my grandfather fled pogrom, um, which was in Minsk, and those were actually his earliest memories were of soldiers coming to um, his, his home and his village basically on horseback with torches to burn down the homes of Jews. Um, and he talked about that for the rest of his life. He was very angry, very traumatized, abusive man. Um, so in terms of the impacts of colonialism and imperialism on Jewish people from Europe, right, it's very different from Jewish people of the Middle East. Many Jewish people lived in Muslim majority societies um, and eventually became immigrants to the state of Israel due to the kind of contestations between Jewish nationalism and the colonization of Palestine and, and Arab nationalism, right? these kinds of contesting political forces. Um, I think that these are histories that Jewish people continue to live with. Um, and at the same time, in the US context, um, when we study like histories of race in, in Europe, they say that it was actually, it was attempted that the racial line would be would divide Europe, right? That, that certain Europeans were considered racially inferior. But upon immigration to the United States and also the creation of the State of Israel, I think is significant in this, but the, the line of whiteness was drawn around Europe rather than through Europe. So Jewish people became white. Um, and I think that that assimilation into whiteness, also for Ashkenazi people, for Jewish people who trace their ancestry to Europe like I do, um, I think that that assimilation um, affects Jewish people today because they were integrated into the colonization of the Americas. And in my family's case, they were integrated into the colonization of California. Um, and I think that being, being integrated into whiteness continues to have an effect. Um, so I'll say, you know, just a little bit more about my own social location. Um, my family is a family that's a lot like probably other Jewish families that y'all have known in California. They were feminists, they were against the Vietnam War, they did not participate in that war, they marched with farm workers, they were very proud um, to be in the movement that was led by Cesar Chavez. Um, and um, so when we think about Jewish leftists, I think very much about my family as a part of that. And the, the question, um, the question that you asked just a minute ago about progressive commitments and, and do they truly exist for us as people in the United States who are, are literally shipping the, the bombs that are making um, the genocide possible in Palestine, um, I think a lot about how we can move um, people towards actually making good on what they say or believe their commitments might be or what we say or believe our commitments might be. So if um, my family comes from a legacy that was um, truly um, damaged and in some cases destroyed by white supremacy, can we not participate in white supremacy but instead contest white supremacy? Um, and how can we turn um, not only Jewish people towards those commitments but also, I, I hope, signal to many other people who would not want to participate in anti-Semitism, right, um, that, that that we, that we also are um, aligned and that we're working together. In some ways, I think of Jewish participation in Palestine solidarity in this country, in this moment, hopefully as a green light to everyone that um, we are indeed um, in, in alignment around our greater commitments and our greater values. Although, right, this kind of trick that's being pulled on everyone that criticizing the state of Israel is in some way anti-Semitic you know, I think that, that it's very important for us to just see that strategy and if Jewish people can help to um, really expose that as a, as a strategy that's not actually rooted in commitment, in justice commitments. Um, and the truth is that the Israeli government and the Israeli society has moved towards a form of fascism 
and a form of Jewish supremacy in recent years has been immensely violent um, in the West Bank and in diaspora where Palestinian people are subject to all kinds of repression um, of their speech and of their self-determination. And that, that form of fascism is, is specific and is terrifying and has to be um, resisted. And I hope that Jewish people can be a part of that. Um, I've been trying, as people have been talking, I've been trying to think about how to answer this too. Um, because uh, when people ask about, well, you know, how does your community think about it? Um, how should they come to uh, be in solidarity with the Palestinian uh, liberation movement? It's kind of, I'm thinking about, well, which community am I, are you talking about? <laughs> Because um, I feel like, um, you know, my identity has so many different parts, you know, and they, and I guess that word intersectional has become popularized, you know, but um, so it's like, well, which one are we talking about? Which one are we focusing in on? And it's just to say, I appreciate having these many identities and being associated with many communities that are, have a history and that are still developing. And so then this question comes up, how do you um, then raise to these different communities that are very diverse and may not be that interacting with each other? How do you, um, you know, uh, effectively um, uh, move that community? And um, here I feel that one thing that helps is to unite the different communities is to be very justice-centered. Because if you have justice at your center, then it's like, then you can figure out better how to um, relate to the different communities and bring them in and talk to them uh, to not only raise consciousness, but actually hoping to develop unity in action. Um, for me, it's like uh, when I think about the movement for Palestinian liberation, it's kind of like, uh, I agree with what people are saying, it, it's a litmus test, you know, especially here in the United States. And uh, so it's a very important way for me, me and my communities to really understand, well, what are we talking about when we talk about social justice, when we talk about um, progressive politics? when we talk about activism. Um, so as a human being, when I look what's happening at, uh, in Gaza, in the occupied territories, it's like, uh, I feel like now it's being, it's, it's easier, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, humanity, us in the United States in particular, we have the ability now to more be able to recognize, to acknowledge, to speak out, and participating in the stopping of genocide, in the stopping of ethnic cleansing. You know, before these kind of things were always far away, you know, and now it's like in your face every day, you know, on television or whatever. And um, so it's like, this is an advance for humanity and for us in the United States to, be, to have the call put to us directly. Do you see genocide? Can you recognize it? Will you stop it? You know, and uh, as a social justice activist, you know, uh, then the question is, well, how do you raise that consciousness? How do you understand the historic and systemic connections how do you actually develop the relations within your co own community, uh, across communities and across borders? And then how do you do this development of unity and action so it really makes a difference so that we can really have change? And um, so here, um, when I look to the movement of, of, for Palestinian liberation, I find a lot of inspiration I find a lot of insights and lessons, you know, that is important, 
you know, for us in the United States, especially, to learn from. And for us, for me, in the Japanese American and Japanese Latin American communities, you know, I look to what our historical experience has been. And then for me, it's mostly been in the United States. And then trying to understand, well, what is my history? What has it been that my people have gone through? Because it, you know, that's a history that's been kind of denied to us, erased, or at best marginalized and discounted. You know, so uh, for us, particularly in the Japanese American community, we are like many in the United States. We've been exposed to a lot of the myths, the lies, you know, and it's kind of trying to f wade our way through it. And um, I think with the, um, the sharp understanding that we see from the Palestinian activists here, it's like, it's been so um, important for us to understand the analysis, to understand the history, to understand some method, getting some method of uh, how do you look at a problem and figure out uh, what does it mean and then how to change that situation. Um, and that's for us in the Japanese American community, I think that's important to do because of our own history of suppression and oppression especially during the World War II period, and then emerging from that, facing uh, the, a role that uh, came upon us of the model minority, and then trying to find what's our niche after being um, demonized and oppressed during World War II. How do you survive? How do you come back? How do you uh, emerge? How do you build community and empowerment? What are the strategies for survival? And then realizing that there are different interests, different points of view within your own community that get um, uh, used, you know, especially by the government or other forces. And then for us to even be conscious of that and realize that. Um, and so, um, um, I think for us in the Japanese American community, and the, I think the significance of the Japanese Latin American experience, especially uh, during the war, wartime, is that we're able to take out our experience of Japanese American incarceration to a more in, uh, diasporic level, to an international level, to um, connect the domestic policies that were. Uh, we were subjected to during the war and tie it to foreign policy and see that connection between uh, what was happening in terms of the uh, imperialist rivalry that was going on in terms of World War II, as well as the uh, national liberation movements, the anti-colonial struggles and its legacies to today. Um, so I feel that um, for us, uh, we're still learning. We're still trying to figure it out. I don't have a lot of profound things to say around it, you know, except that I'm really open to learning and sharing and figuring out collectively with other people because it's not just going to be coming from my communities, I can tell you that, you know, and actually the, 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 the effort the struggle to put into that um, building of a, a broader um, uh, networking and actually movement building, and within that community building, that's in a broad, very broad sense, is so important. And that it's not only in the United States, but it goes across international borders because we have connections in so many other countries. And that this, in, at this moment in time, I think the Palestinian people have so much um, to um, uh, share with us, you know, so many insights and lessons. And, um, and for us, it's not just uh, thinking that, oh, we're just going to, you know, <laughs> 
um, suck that up, but it's really to understand our strategic relationship that our future is tied with their future. You know, our ability to um, uh, resist and overcome the forces of fascism, the right wing, that's both inter uh, domestic and international, and our ability to envision actually a different world, something that we will be making along the way as we try and figure it out. This is like, um, I think, the challenge that is put to us. And um, I don't know, I feel, at least today, I'm feeling very hopeful, you know, and very encouraged and, and energized too. It's genuinely a privilege to just bask in the, the wisdom and, um, again, honesty that you all have brought into this space. Um, hearing, I'm using some moderator privilege, I'm going to use the mic for a couple minutes, um, but just hearing, you know, you all talk about the, the, very, the variety of ways in which our lives and your lives and your ancestries have been treated as disposable, treated as, you know, have been literally kidnapped, have been um, erased and have been pitted against one another. And yet there is a core of resistance and resilience and survival, uh, survivorship um, trying to move into, you know, what we would like to describe as thriving. But there has been that that capacity to continue to do that in our communities and, 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 um, and to find those relationships and those connections that enable it. Um, I'm curious, I'm gonna to try to shift us into some tangible-ish things that people might be able to engage with leaving this space. Um, because I think there is also that, you know, there is that legacy of trauma and that legacy of being, having this harm forced on our communities um, in their in their um, diversity, but there is also again that inherited legacy of resistance and resilience. And so, in in your own organizing, in the organizing of the people in which you're in relationship with, what have been some of the methods that you have used? What have been some of the strategies, um, tactics, philosophies? You know, what what it, how are you creating that community? How are you organizing together? Um, you know, I know um, Zainab mentioned like this is a climate issue. This is, um, you know, and there's been conversation about uh, how you know this ties into like the rise of fascism here within the United States. And so, what are what are the ways in which we can organize together um, and, and uh, rely on that and build on that legacy of resilience and resistance? I know that's technically not one of the questions I sent you. I'm trying to fudge it with some of the things that. Um, I had sent you, so um, please, if you are willing to engage, um, thank you. I can start um, with this one. So a few different things. I think, first of all, we must all take our uh, call to action from the people in Palestine who have been leading the movements for national liberation this whole time, the political prisoners, the farmers, the workers, the students, uh, civil society, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room knows, has put out a call, Palestinian civil society in 2005, to boycott, divest, call for sanctions. Uh, this is critical. This is something we have to be doing here in the United States. Um, another thing that I've been doing, I come from a legal context right now, and so I've been doing a lot of Know Your Rights sessions. Uh, Pro-Palestine activism and speech is being actively criminalized in this country, and it's going to have repercussions for all justice movements, not just those in solidarity with Palestine. So we need to resist this. We need to fight this. We need to name it and call it out. We need to recognize that attempts to redefine or to define anti-Semitism as uh, you know, voicing anything that is critical of Israel um, is hugely problematic, and and you know that cannot enter into our legislation or even our, um, you know, our places of work or other various institutions of which we uh, are a part. 
And I think, you know, I think all of that has been true before October and it continues to be true now. But I think I, when I think about how I plan to change the work that I do, given everything that is going on, given how obvious it is to me, and I hope to more people than ever before, that Israel is a terrorist state that needs to be dealt with, I plan on changing the way that I speak to people about Israel. You know, look me in the face and tell me that Israel is not a terrorist state. I will wait and I will be happy to engage you on that issue. You know, it's, it's not possible. It's not possible right now. Um, Israel is a, it sh should be made to be a, the pariah state that it is. We should not be engaging Israel at contracts if we are, you know, at universities or wherever. We should not be doing collaborations with Israeli academics who have not, you know, vowed their support for the Palestinian cause. Uh, we should not be doing business with Israeli corporations. We should follow the model that, uh, that South Africans, that the, that the rest of the world followed, really, in helping to bring about the dismantling of the apartheid regime in South Africa by isolating that country, not by appealing to its moral sensibilities. If it was not clear before, it should be crystal clear that Israel does not have moral sensibilities. And so I think it is, frankly, a waste of time to make that appeal. Uh, and fundamentally, there can be no peace. You know, we, we, we hold space and we, we want peace. We pray for peace. We call for peace. There cannot be peace without justice. Too many Palestinians have lost their lives in order to return to the status quo. That's not, that was not, you know, the, the plan here. Palestinians have resisted calls to leave their land, knowing what the alternative is, which is mass murder, which is happening. They know that. And they have stood steadfast in their homes and said, you can kill us, but we are not leaving our land. So we cannot go back. A ceasefire is the bare minimum. But we cannot go back, and we need to continue to visualize what a liberated Palestine looks like and to do everything we can to support the institutions and the people that will be a part of that liberated Palestine. And everything else is simply what gets in the way and I think can be irrelevant and can be distracting. I think now more than ever, we have to find our communities and move them towards this uh, visualized, liberated Palestinian vision. Um, thank you, um, and, and thank you for this question. I, um, you know, I want to I want to echo that it's it seems very important to me. It seems like an important ethics that we just have to keep reiterating that we should be listening to Palestinian people. It's it's very painful to listen to kind of state discourse or kind of mainstream politics that are talking about what could happen after um, after this horrible violence without just making moves to stop it immediately. Um, so I'm encouraging people to listen to, um, listen to Palestinian people individually and collectively um, as they envision their survival and their future. And that seems like major. I think as people in the United States, we have to be looking at stopping US military aid to Israel. It just seems like the most important thing from, from this place um, that the, I, I, I read recently that in, if, if we could stop the munitions for three days, um, the state of Israel wouldn't, wouldn't have a stockpile. And that just sound, that's such an immense transfer of materials across the globe. It has to stop. Um, so anything that we can do to be a part of that, I think is extremely meaningful. So continuing to organize, um, of course, I'm working with Jewish Voice for Peace and hoping to just contribute more strength to the truth that anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. It seems like a really important thing for us to hold and be able to share with others. So I wanna keep going with that. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm teaching and I'm, I'm, I, I teach on these issues um, and I support student organizing. So it seems really important to do that, especially because I do think that students are especially under attack um, as, as well as professors, university staff, they're really coming for us. I'm experiencing that too. Um, so we're working against that repression. Um, and then I guess I'll say that one place that I think is important for Oakland and for our communities here, the incredible work that we've done to understand um, the violence of policing and the prison industrial complex, Palestine is a center of that globally. And if we can understand that better and make sense out of that better, the state of Israel has used um, a system of colonial courts and um, prisons um, absolutely as a fundamental anchor of its occupation and its colonization of Palestine from the beginning. At the same time, we here are subject to the kinds of technologies of surveillance and of policing that are violent that are indeed created in the Palestine laboratory, right? In the laboratory of the colonization of Palestinian people. I think if we can make those connections politically and 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 raise that those points of solidarity, they seem really deep and um, and meaningful to continue with. Um, I was just gonna echo both of these that a, listen to the voice of Palestinian people. And I think it's really important for us to continue to radicalize our own communities as well, to continue to draw these very concrete linkages between houselessness here and displacement in our homelands and in Palestine, about anti-blackness globally, about violence, about these cycles of colonization where um, we just get trapped over and over again. And the more that we can do to continue to push our own communities to make those linkages, I think the stronger the movement is for liberation in Palestine and for collective liberation overall. Um, and I agree with what people are saying. And I guess I just wanna make a plug that um, we, yes, we do have to stop this U.S. funding, you know, uh, and that's like economic aid, military aid, social and political um, cover that's being provided. Uh, and then I think what that poses for us is we got to figure out how to deal with the upcoming U.S. elections in 2024. We got to protect um, the, those elected officials at all levels of government who have stood up for ceasefire, that are um, standing up for the Palestinian people. And uh, we have to figure out, you know, how to stop the, this government uh, from doing what it's doing. So it's just to say that um, uh, the importance of the elections coming up, the importance of our electoral strategy, and uh, uh, the need to develop you know, plans for whatever outcome happens. Um, I just um, agree with everything that folks have raised. Um, it's a, it is important and vital to organize our communities um, and um, to basically expose the linkages that the imperialists are making in regards to like just weaponry the you know how they're aiding each other how they're backing each other they are surely seeing their work as connected we need to do the same thing and see how our work and our struggles are connected um, it's important for us to get organized and to um, help folks understand help folks in our communities understand that they have a stake in our collective liberation and to work towards that coll collective uh, liberation. For example, if you have friends that are queer, that are trans, like have conversations about pinkwashing and how their identities are being used to further um, Zionism or used to further imperialism. Like as our folks, as folks up here have named, there are so many ways that we each have found entry points into solidarity for Palestinian liberation keep having those conversations and um, have folks understand 
how their liberation is tied up in the liberation of others around us, right? Like some folks might not understand what collective liberation is. And it's important for us to understand that, not just intellectually, but um, to take action with that principle as well. Um, find organized opportunities to fight fascists. <laughs> like, what was it, last month? Was it last month when, no to APEC? when APEC was here? Last month, um, folks were rising up with each other. We were opposing fascist leadership from Korea, from Japan, from um, the U.S., from the Philippines. We were all coming together and also using these efforts as a way to point towards Palestinian liberation as well. If there are opportunities to fight the fascists who are making such strong and close connections, like they're working every day to it, they're putting billions of dollars towards it, we should and have the responsibility to oppose those efforts, to expose those efforts and oppose them so that we can bring those efforts down. Um, we can stop the U.S. war machine. We will stop the U.S. war machine. We will stop um, the, the, the genocide that Israel is, is conducting and doing, imposing the violence that they're um, inflicting upon people because it's not going to end there. The U.S. is not going to stop wherever they say their borders are. Israel is not going to stop wherever they say their borders are. They're going to keep going until we're all so-called assimilated um, into this colonial body. And that is not going to happen, right? We're not going to let that happen. And I just wanted to raise that too, just recognizing that queer and trans folks are often very targeted <laughs> by genocides historically and around the world. It's not enough for us to fight for gay marriage or those things, those things are important. I'm gay married, whatever. Um, <laughs> but people are dying. Um, and people like our healers, our scholars, the world's best are the ones that we are losing in, in this genocide um, and in genocides throughout the world. So um, yeah, just do what you can to try to remember how tied up our liberation is. And if you have folks around you who don't understand that, who aren't seeing that, who are asking these questions, help them. You're here because you see that connection. Help them see that connection. Help them deepen that connection. Wow, I'll hit retweet one, two, three, four, five times for everything that the folks have noted. Um, I'll add two things. The first one is one of the things that we've been attempting to organize around at the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California is to highlight the role and the emphasis on hyper-consumerism and materialism uh, at the service of empire, at the service of colonization, at the service of militant capitalism. So for example, during Black Friday, we actually held a program, a teach-in, um, and also um, offered space and resources for folks to call their representatives, and we called it Black Juma, Juma meaning Friday, uh, which is where Muslims gather for uh, the weekly congregational prayers. So I think uh, faith organizations, and I really want to commend and, and offer my gratitude uh, and thanks to um, all of the reverends and all of the organizers here, uh, and really invite us and offer my own willingness and commitment to establish not simply short-term uh, or isolated engagements with one another, but to really commit to uh, interlinking for the long-term and committing for the long-term, whether it is with our Jewish brothers and sisters, whether it is with, with Christians, Catholics, Buddhists, Hindus, people of various faith commitments or people of various philosophies, as, as other folks have noted, that our struggle and our liberation are all intertwined, they're, inter, they're interlinked. Um, and then the other thing that I think is quite important is to prepare ourselves, particularly for those who are in positions of leadership and particularly those who are in positions of faith leadership, to prepare congregations and prepare our own circles and friends and, and others for the long term. I think the, the impact, the emotional and spiritual and psychological and physical harm of the last 85 days and of course the last 75 years 
uh, have really began to manifest themselves in many ways, and I think they will continue to manifest themselves because no human being with a beating heart can look and can observe what has been happening, whether it is in Palestine, whether it is in, uh, elsewhere, whether it is here in our own streets, in our own neighborhoods, and then go about life in a normal way. And it really reminds me of a very beautiful axiom in the Islamic uh, tradition, which says that people are of two kinds. They're either your equals in faith or your equals in humanity. There's really nothing beyond that. And I think if we were to come together and recognize that and work around that, there can be tremendous progress that can be made. But that, of course, requires long-term commitment and also an interrogation as to what is it that my community is falling short in? What is it that we can be doing that we're not doing? Um, so I think, again, we have to disconnect ourselves from this hyper-consumerism and hyper-materialism that has really taken hold of, of our societies and communities in many ways, especially for those who are refugees and, and others, and as folks had mentioned, um, victims of assimilation or forced assimilation. And then the second thing is really commit to long-term strategies and long-term partnerships. Thank you all. Can we have another um, round of applause, gratitude for our speakers who have been really... So this is a teach-in, which means there is a moment of shared action that we would like to invite you into. Um, I recognize that we are a little bit over time, but um, if folks have uh, a smartphone talking about capitalism and consumption, um, I invite you to go to a bit.ly that we have created that has an action, a small action toolkit, bit.ly slash global south. One two three one, bit dot l y. Globe bit o oh, b i t dot l y slash global south one two three one. If I had thought ahead, I would have written it out somewhere. Um, and there you'll see a couple of actions that we can take together now that you can continue to take. Um, are folks finding it? Yes, b i t dot L Y slash global south one two three one. And so there's a couple of actions that we can take. Some of them are supporting our siblings in this effort um, locally. The Bay Bridge 78, as some know, have been uh, are facing charges for their their actions of solidarity um, when they shut down the bridge and, in protest of APEC um, in recently. Um, and there's also opportunity to support other local protesters who are experiencing the violence of our, our policing system here in the Bay Area um, directly in response to the work they're doing to support Palestine. And then there are more national efforts to reach out to Senators Padilla and Butler um, to, in, to ask them to uh, demand a ceasefire and stop all aid to Israel. Uh, as well as a similar uh, action to Biden as well, because we know that right now these electeds are not taking the stance that we need them to for our shared liberation. So those are some of the actions you can take in this moment. You can make calls, you can send emails, um, and to continue to take those, that bit.ly will remain live for folks to use going forward. Um, yeah, and so take, we can take a couple minutes to do that. But I do want to also pass the mic over to Ronnie, who will uh, close us out. Um, yeah. So before we close out, I'd like to just uh, um, release the global ancestors that we called in today from the north to the west to the south and to the east. And from the center, we go out to do our action in the world. We can keep our global ancestors in our hearts, but for now, hail and farewell to our global ancestors. I would also like to say 
that yes, we are shared humanity. We are humans on this earth. And I'd like to honor us as people and also all of the other organisms on this earth. This is our home. This is our home, and we have to take care of our home. The ocean refuses no river, no river. The ocean refuses no river, no river. Ishkala mabudlala ilala. Ishkala mabudlala ilala. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be. Thank you. So I just want to, I just want to close us out and thank you all for coming. Um, but before we do that, um, on your tables, you'll see a sheet of paper with a QR code on it. Um, so this event was made possible by donations. Um, so if you are feeling pretty heavy in your step, heavy in your pockets, um, and are in a giving mood, we would love to receive whatever you have to share. Um, and last thing that I wanted to say, that an organizer that I looked up to in Chicago, I used to li live there, he would always say, Always send to the people that are closest to the pain. So whatever pain is happening in the world, go to the folks that are experiencing it and learn their stories. Thank you. Break the cycle of violence. Thousands die by... We need a ceasefire now. Break the cycle of violence. Thousands die by your silence. We need a ceasefire now. Ceasefire now. Cease fire now! Cease fire now! Thank you, everyone! Thank you again. Feel free to take some food. If you made a poster, take it with you for your next inevitable action.